So last week we talked about our overarching philosophy of ministry at ResPres um, is that we, <clears throat> we are endeavoring to practice a spiritually vibrant orthodoxy. We talked all last week. It's not enough to just be orthodox. If you are orthodox and lock yourself in a closet, it, it, uh, that's not, not the goal. Not the goal of the church. Although orthodoxy is vitally important, I mean, you don't, yeah, orthodoxy is crucially important so that when we are, in, you know, when we are engaging the world, um, we're engaging them with truth. That's important. <laughs> uh, but it's not enough on its own. We are, we're, we're trying to be a, a church that's not just orthodox, but that orthodoxy is creating, is recreating our hearts into the beauty of Christ. Uh, and that beauty of Christ then becomes the light that people see in the world and that uh, causes them to give glory to God in heaven. So how um, the re next three weeks are going to be about like how we go about that, particularly at ResPress. If you look, um, pretty much the New Testament spells out that any, New Te any church should be doing three things. We should be worshiping God, creating disciples, and engaging the world in mission, right? Part of that mission Engaging the world is also a mercy mission to the poor and to uh, the oppressed and, and whatnot. Um, but those are the three things we're supposed to be doing, and pretty much the only three things we're supposed to be doing. Um, and it's helpful to keep that in mind so that we are able, it's helpful to know that so that we focus our energies and our resources on the stuff that we're supposed to be doing and not get all tied up in all kind of stuff that we're not supposed to be doing as a church or that we're not really geared to do or shaped to do. We can only do so much, right? I had heard a speaker tell, say once that, um, you know, there's a million things that churches try to do that if they stop doing them, the next day there'd still be a, a thousand nonprofits or other organizations trying to do the same things in the world. However, if the church stops preaching the gospel and stops uh, engaging the world and it, with the mission of evangelism, no one, there's no other, uh, there's no other organism that can take that up. No other organization on, on earth that, that will f continue that if we don't. So we need to keep the main thing, the main thing. Uh, and according to the New Testament, that means we worship God collectively as a body and individually and as families. We create disciples, which is what we're doing right now. Uh, and all of that is, ser is to serve that final purpose of creating disciples who are, who are equipped and capable and have the emotional margin and the spiritual maturity to engage the world in the mission of the church. You don't want to just, you know, they all work together. So today we're going to talk about the importance of worship uh, and what makes us distinctive, what makes uh, Reformed churches in general and what makes Re Res Pres distinctive in, uh, in our philosophy of, of worship. So um, t what we're going to talk about is this, essentially the idea that um, worship isn't just something that we come and do as an activity, it, it shapes us. What, the Bible's full of verses that talk about you become like what you worship. Whatever is most valuable and most important in your life <laughs> you'll start to slowly become like that thing, like the, like the idols of the you know, Old Testament. The prophets would warn that you know, if you if worship these idols of the Old Testament, you'd start to become like them, dumb and deaf and all, you know, it, all the weird stuff that they would do. But the same is true for us. If we worship our cultural idols, we begin, our, 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 our hearts begin to be warped into the image of the world. Um, and so worship, that's the basic idea of what we're going to talk about, how worship shapes us. Um, let's look at Romans 8, verse 5. Listen, listen carefully to what this is saying. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now, I read that verse for 17 years, not even kidding. Until just last year, really, and I and because I'm a because I'm a, I'm I'm a I'm a good individualistic American rationalist, and I was raised to be a rationalist. 
Um, I think that everything is thinking first and then doing. You think your way into action. You think your way into uh, movement. You think your way into things because that's what rationalists think. And that's what we've been trained since birth. And so I read this for 17 years. I read this verse and I thought it was like, I, and I was like, this is, okay, I get it. Simple. If I set my thing, my minds on the things of the flesh, then I'll live according to the flesh. But if I set my mind on the things of the spirit, then I'll live according to the spirit. Easy breezy, right? But that's not what it says. It says the opposite. It says those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on, their minds become set on the flesh. And those who live according to the spirit, their minds become set on the spirit. And so it says the totally opposite thing. It says what I do shapes and sets my mind and forms me into something else. Uh, and so if I live and I'm, and I'm living and pursuing sin, that sin is going to shape my mind and warp my soul even more to desire that sin. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> we all know that from experience. <laughs> and yet if I live into the reality of who I am as a new creature with the spirit of God inside me and I just live into that and trust that that's true, all of a sudden my mind begins to be set on the things of the Spirit and my soul begins to be shaped more into the likeness of Christ. I mean, how many times have you talked with someone or, or on your own been like beset with some, some sin you can't get over and you're just like reading, I mean, this is, I'm, this, I'm like reading books, right? I'm reading every book I can get my hand on on the mortification of sin or you know, reading all the Puritan classic texts about how to think my way into or understand, like, what's the process of fighting sin so that I can be more successful in my life? Uh, <laughs> and this says something totally different, that what we do is we live into who we are, and that's what shapes us. And that's what, and that's what worship is. When we come to worship, we're living into that spirit of, of that we're living into... Uh, we're living according to the spirit and the, pr and, the pr and the end result of that is that our minds then start to become set on the things of the spirit. How have you, no has, how have you noticed or have you noticed at all how worship has shaped you or how worship has changed you or what's your, you know, anybody have any general thoughts about that or any experience here or other churches or Anything along that line? Merle? Maybe. Well, before I found the Reformed faith that I was going to the mega churches that are here in San Diego, like Sunrise and Foothill and the other ones like that, it was, uh, I was just really discouraged and I just knew there was something more. I wasn't happy. Yeah. Have you guys ever thought about that before, about what you do, like forms and shapes your mind? Anything, have any other examples of stuff you've done, like outside of worship, that has like shaped you from doing it? Not to get like, not to fifth step on everybody in the... <laughs> Situationally relative to my outside experience. 
Uh, so being able to have that grounded framework um, uh, was kind of opened up the door for me to be able to um, give weight to spiritual practices. Um, same with um, uh, with chanting. I was able to feel an, an elation um, that uh, helped me have like a joy that flooded me th like throughout my day and, and being able to like bring that and have that as a filter throughout my day. It wasn't enough. A lot of times it was very, very fleeting. I was in the reform space that it, there was something that was lasting um, where, you know, the, the grace of God for me was a filter that I was able to like have in, in the world that like uh, I was able to have a, a kind of a, a grace for others as a result. <laughs> um, um, and so, so, so yes, there was power in all of these practices. They were just insu insufficient, I guess. Um, I don't know if that's what you were asking. Hmm, sure. But the actions, even if I didn't believe in the faith, okay. uh, gave me a, an experience that was weightful. Okay. Okay. I, can I add to it too? Yeah. I think also it's this worship is kind of, not kind of, it's a reset every week. This rhythm of communing with God in a more holistic way than what I could do by myself. And then being with his people and mentally having that reset and then going back into the scurry of the week and then looking forward to the reset again that's coming next Sunday. <laughs> so it's kind of a pause. Yeah. Okay. Kind of the format that I want to follow in the next three classes is to, if we are, if we are trying to practice a spiritually vibrant orthodoxy, I want to look at different I want to, we're going to contrast that with what it looks like to practice a spirit or a vibrant heresy versus a dead orthodoxy, and then uh, and then having those contrasts in place, look at what it what it looks like to practice a spiritually vibrant orthodoxy in our worship. Um, so, quick history lesson. I'm going to talk about the first. I'm going to talk about a making of a the making of a praise God. We're saved. We're saved. Um, <laughs> the coffee is here. I'm going to talk first about making the making of a vibrant heresy. Something I'm going to call spiritual WalMarts. Okay. Now, uh, I want to make quick disclaimers. I'm not. Uh, this is yes. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the megachurch phenomenon right now, but I don't want to, I'm not insinuating that every big church uh, is like this. There are and have been big churches in, in the world that have been very orthodox and very good and very, very much able to care for, care for their people. However, there have been a lot of examples that are what I would call, what I like to call spiritual Walmarts. Now, what does that, what does that mean? What does that mean to be a spiritual Walmart? Quick history lesson. After, um, after World War II, there was a, um, as you can imagine, after uh, you know, six, seven years of brutal global warfare and the impending threat of, new, you know, of, new, new, of nuclear war, which was a new thing, people were like, more likely to start thinking about God again. And there was, like a, there was a big resurgence in the churches. This, this church in particular, First Pres, was one of those churches that exploded after the war. Um, uh, with 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 church growth and um, you know they this, they already had this building but churches ha were were exploding in growth and having everyone had building projects going on that that apartment tower across the street Westminster Manor is like a low income apartment complex that this church oversaw building as a like an act of of, of like um, service to the community to create uh, an, a, a huge apartment complex of affordable housing downtown. 
that was kind of how it was. Churches were exploding. Everybody was building. There was a resurgence of, of faith, at least cultural faith. There was uh, some of it was very mixed up with, uh, with, you know, patriotism and God and country religion. However, the churches were exploding. And then all of a sudden, almost on a dime in 1965, for various reasons, a lot of them had to do with the way churches responded to the Vietnam War conflict and, and other things. Almost overnight, it stopped and churches started declining. Uh, and people were freaking out and they were like, what, what are we going to do? What, how, how did that happen? Why, does, why is this happening? What should we do? What can we do about it? And there was a group of missiologists. Missiologists are guys and girls who are uh, academics who study missions. And basically what they said, um, centered in at, at Fuller Seminary up in uh, Los Angeles, basically what they said was this. They were like, we've been doing... We've been doing the same thing for 2,000 years, and it's gotten stale and dusty, and no one can relate to it anymore. The way we do our worship services, no one understands it. Um, people don't seem to understand that why or how Christianity or faith has any relevance to their everyday daily life. So what we need to do is this. Instead of focusing on the vertical relationship of the church with God, instead, we're going to redo our architecture of the churches. We're going to start making our churches look like concert halls or uh, movie theaters. And, or um, we're going to make our churches look more like American shopping malls. Or, um, and we're going to have our worship services are going to be focused mainly on people, on seekers, people who are, come, or who are trying to bring into Christianity. Uh, and so... Um, they thought, well, all we need to do is figure out what do people, what do people feel like their needs are in life? What do people feel like the church or religion could help them with in life? And we'll do big surveys of the community and we'll figure out like how, you know, how we can meet those needs or we'll figure out ways that Christianity meets those needs. And that's what we'll teach and that's what we'll preach about. And lo and behold, it worked, sort of. Churches started like blowing up and filling up with people. Uh, and so, in the one sense, we have churches that ended up becoming like permanent tent revivals, almost, where the focus was so much on like reaching the lost that the aspect of the vertical relationship between God and his people was kind of put in on hold. Um, but the other outcome of that was we had these big churches now that were following um, the norms and the habits uh, and the cultural sensibilities of American shopping malls and concert halls. Uh, and there was a guy named, there's a theologian named uh, James K.A. Smith who wrote, he wrote a bunch of books or his thing is he talks about cultural liturgies. And basically what does that mean? What does cultural liturgy mean? It means that, it means that, that aspect of shaping, right? What we do, what our habits are, um, and what we engage in separate or, or shapes us into a certain thing. Uh, and so after the fact, we kind of realize, or we have realized, that by taking, taking the church and, and, and modeling it after shopping malls and movie theaters and concert halls, especially the, you know, that ideal of shopping malls, um, we started to mold and shape people into the values, into those secular values, right? Think about it this way. James K.A. Smith, he said, you know, he makes he this thought experiment where he says, if, let's say, a thousand years from now, alien archaeologists came and like dug up uh you know and studied ancient you know the remnants of ancient uh shopping malls they would they would they would, they would potentially think that they were religious centers right uh because there's you know every the, uh, every, ide every every ideology every worldview has its version of the gospel what what saves us Every, every ideology has a version of what's the ultimate good and what every, every, every worldview has an ideal of like what the blessedness of the state of man is, right? And 
if you look at American culture and shopping malls is the like, you know, the spiritual center of that, if you will. You go to the shopping mall, what? You feel anxiety, you feel like less than, you feel like you need to like fit in or, or you know, present yourself in a certain way to the public so that you'll be accepted. You go to the shopping mall and you can buy things that will make you feel good about yourself, that will make you like more accepted and more loved in, in the culture. Uh, and, uh, and then everything's gonna be okay, right? So what, he's, what he tries, what, what he, his theory is, and, and I think he's, there's a lot to it, is that by shifting the values of the church and the way we go about doing things uh, and the values that we have as a church, by shifting those to making worship services like concerts uh, and more like American shopping malls than, spirit, than, than worship centers, what we've done unwittingly is we've trained an entire generation of Christians and shaped them into that basically narcissistic consumerist shoppers of religion in the world. And that's like totally true. I mean, as a, as a pastor, we see that all the time. You ask people, why do you go to, why do you go to X church? Oh, I, like their, I like their children's ministry. Why do you go to Albertsons? I like their produce department. It's the same thing. People like are sh like they shop around. People shop around as religious consumers, and reform people do this too. I'm not. This is not an evangelical phenomenon, right? Reform shoppers are looking for their like perfect version of you know what they envision you know reformed orthodoxy to look like or or whatever. But they, people shop around. They shop around for your you know your how is your children's ministry? What do I what do I want? How do I want to be served? How do I want the church to serve me? And I'm going to shop around and find the church that has meets, ticks the most of my boxes, and then I'll go there, you know, occasionally. <laughs> that's, that's what's up with American Christianity. Uh, we've created a whole generation of religious consumers. And there's fallout to that, right? There's fallout to that because then the churches... And pastors who are under pressure to succeed and under pressure to keep their churches afloat, what are you going to do? You start catering to that. Um, you know, and then so we have this landscape where there's all these, all these churches that are out there competing for the ever-shrinking marketplace of believers in this like consumeristic, narcissistic rush to, to establish their brand. Man. Um, that's a real thing. How's anyone seen that happen? Or am I, you know, anybody disagree? Karen, let me go. Go ahead, Karen. Um, so it reminds me kind of, because we've been parts of different uh, worshiping communities and um, mega church is one of them. Um, and I feel like it kind of focuses in on your emotion. Um, you go to the church, you know, you're, you're emotionally charged. It's an emotionally charged service. Um, people are, you know, raising hands and hooting and hollering and doing whatever they got to do in the service. It's very emotional. Um, but it's like candy, it's like, um, it's like mm. junk food. So you get that emotional charge, maybe it lasts you for a little while, and then you crash because you're not um, being fed meat. Yeah. <laughs> you're not being fed meat, something that's going to sustain you for more than a few minutes after worship. And so then you need to go back again, and you need to go to Wednesday, and you need to go to Friday, and you need to go to Saturday, and you need to go to, you know, you're there every minute because nothing is filling you yeah. um, because it's all junk food. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how I feel, and, if, and I, you know, I know that we're called to worship with all of our minds, you know, and our hearts. But I feel like the mind part is something that um, is missing in a lot of those scenarios. It's okay to have coffee in the morning, but you also have to have food. Yeah. What's that? Got to have both. Good. You got to have both coffee and your yeah. food, not just your coffee. You can't just have coffee and then be like, I'm good for the day. Not true. <laughs> <laughs> Dis <laughs> disagree. Uh, coffee's good. I'm good. Coffee and a protein shake. I'm good for the day. 
Uh, yeah, and then those, and then what happens? What? Why is that bad? Oh, no, sorry. I was just going to say, I recently had gone with my neighbor to a Bible study, and <clears throat> these women all go to a mega church, and I found that when I sat in on the Bible study and they spoke about things, I felt like it steered off from the main point, which is the gospel. So I felt like it, it lost direction. Kind of veered into yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> It just yeah. they put in a lot of extras, a lot of emotional judgments, not focusing on why we're here, which is to read the text, to learn the text, and to live like Christ. Yeah. What's the big bummer? Why is that a bummer? It's because it, that's a great example. It, it's, it's malnourishment. And why is that a big bummer? Because it's then sending all of these malnourished Christians out into the world who think they're full. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to be starving and know you're starving. It's another thing to be st- starving, but you've, you've ate nothing but junk food. So you feel full, but you don't have any strength. Your body's not being strengthened. We run across that every once in a while. I have a friend who had a new coworker come into the work, and this coworker was like, rah, rah, Jesus and everything. But it was like rah rah Jesus in this really like selfish and narcissistic way, and I go ask her if she goes to blank church. <laughs> she went to work the next day. And she's like, "How did you know? How did you know she went to that church? Because that this particular church that I know of specializes in that particular flavor of hyped up emotional. Jesus is going to meet all our needs." Um, all our needs happen to be like radically self-centered and and (laughs) self-focused. And that's the thing, like I think the spiritual condition is 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 not met. It's just um, uh, tried, it's just fixed with a bunch of like outside needs. Um, So you get, you know, the to-do list and so you go to these churches and you're like, I need this. I need a good ministry for my kids, and I need a very charismatic service, and I, can, and I need all of these things, but they're... Rock concert. Right, rock concert. I need a rock concert, but, like, <laughs> at the end of it, like, there is no sustenance, you know? They're spiritually not having that food, yeah. and, and so they're going around thinking that they're meeting needs, and, that, and, and their needs aren't met, and it's a cycle, so it's all... Con- it's consumptive because we need to worship and we need to be filled and it's not, yeah. yeah Brian. The focus turned off from, like you said, the focus turned off from Jesus. Yeah. Kind of making it about Jesus and make, making it about us. And therefore, uh, one that's what drew us here was the focus was on Jesus. Yeah. And, uh, that's something that, that was missing. That's the, th- that's the thing. The one box that's not on, on most people's list is, does this church faithfully preach the gospel and is it capable of shaping me into the likeness of Christ? It's not, it's, th- there's not even a category for it. That's how bad it is. Pe- you don't know what you don't know, right? When we planted this church, I, went, I took a whole core team, I took it, them to X church, massive church. They were so, they did everything with excellence the minute they took a middle school and literally transformed it through volunteer power and staging and uh, panels and they like transformed this inner city middle school church to look like a mega church facility they had you know bi- you know kiosks and you know big screens and like the, you when you showed up there was somebody who greeted you and welcomed you and the coffee was on point and you met the pastors and you walked in and everything was orderly and everything was like super well done the the branding the aesthetics were all on point so you didn't you know nothing was awkward or felt you know janky or shady uh the music was astonishingly beautiful and then you know and then the pastor and his wife rode down the center aisle in a two-wheeled, on a, on a, on a bicycle for two <laughs> and preached a sermon on how to have a DTR in a Christian relationship. Define the relationship. Nothing about Jesus, nothing about the gospel. And so I sat them down and I was like, listen, you're the Smith family. You know nothing. 
you know, nothing, you, you, you just know what you know. You know, you, you know you're Christian, you know you want to follow Jesus, but you don't really understand the gospel. You don't really understand the purpose of the church and worship shaping you and forming you into its culture, into the culture of heaven. And so you go to, you go to the ex-church that does everything amazing and has a perfect child program and, and 